This is Maharajas of Skill, a podcast where we go behind the scenes and talk to founders who are demolishing the myths around building and scaling a big business in India. These are the stories that have shattered the assumptions around Indian consumers and are changing the game completely. I am Krishna Jonakardla, serial entrepreneur, co-founder of Flit, the fashion locator in town and startup mentor, bringing you these stories. A quick note about this episode as it is something that we have never done before. We are always interested in new scale playbooks that are taking the context around them and putting a startup on the path to scale. We are even more interested if they are from around the world where the context is varied and dynamic. Our hope is that some of those tactics become relevant to our entrepreneurs who are trying hard to scale their ventures in India, which is why today we are interviewing Alex Lazarov, who has written a wonderful book on how a new breed of innovators he calls Frontier innovators are innovating and scaling with their own playbooks outside the valley from Delhi to Detroit. I had fun chatting with him and I'm certain you will too. Listen on. Hey listeners, today we have a fantastic speaker, Alex Lazarov. Alex is the author of the book Out Innovate, where he chronicles how entrepreneurs across the world are writing a new playbook of building scaling startups. It is a fascinating read and I highly encourage our listeners to check this book out. Alex is also a global venture investor and an adjunct professor at Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, California. Today we are going to talk to Alex about his own journey and also the stories and insights about scale that are peppered all over the book. Alex, welcome to the show. It's good to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have this discussion. Wonderful. Tell us a bit about yourself and your journey about how you came to the world of startups and investing. Happily. Um, I've always worked at the intersection of innovation, questions of impact and investing. So by day, I'm a venture capitalist. I work for a fund called Cathay Innovation. Um, it's a globally focused venture fund based in Paris, but investing across Asia, Europe, North America. We also have a Pan-Africa venture fund, the groups affiliated with Cathay Capital. That's my day job. I've been there for about uh, two and a half years. Before that, I was at Omidyar Network, investing in startups around the world. Um, and then outside of work, I have been uh, teaching entrepreneurship, like you mentioned, at the Middlebury Institute, and have always been kind of focused on those kind of questions. So before that, I spent some time uh, working in strategy consulting, principally in emerging markets, spent some time uh, doing uh, regulatory work with the Central Bank of Canada. A lot of the industries I care a lot about are highly regulated, like financial services or healthcare and others, and I wanted to understand those dynamics. And you know, before that, a little bit more of a traditional finance background. Um, so. Uh, in many ways, I'm really passionate about investing in startups and entrepreneurs um, outside the valley and around the world. Great. Tell us how the book came to be. What was the spark or the trigger that drove you to write this book? So the book, Out Innovate, How Global Entrepreneurs from Delhi to Detroit are Rewriting the Rules of Silicon Valley. I just published it with Harvard Business Review Press in April. And, you know, the genesis of the book, I'm, I'm in many ways an accidental author. I had been teaching my class at the Middlebury Institute, and I was getting increasingly frustrated that I wanted to sign my students books on entrepreneurship and innovation. And yet, everything I had was invariably context specific, it was incredibly centered in a time and a place, Silicon Valley and today, and for a very particular type of asset by software based startup that wants to grow extraordinarily fast. And so I always felt like I had to contextualize it with the reality of building startups in more emerging startup ecosystems. I grew up in the middle of Canada, a small town called Winnipeg. A lot of my students were doing that. They were going back home to wherever they were from, or they were moving in many cases to emerging markets to build build businesses. And uh, and and that was the motivation of starting to write. I think the best entrepreneurs operating in in places around the world, from Chicago to Amsterdam to Nairobi to Bangalore, have more in common with the best entrepreneurs operating in Sao Paulo than they do with those operating in San Francisco. And yet, no one is telling their stories. And so I decided I would. I interviewed about 200 entrepreneurs from around the world. Uh, most of them folks that are leading some of the biggest uh, startups. Uh, so a couple hundred million dollars to have already exited and, 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 and succeeded um, and sold their businesses. And, and I think that increasingly, startup best practice outside the Valley is not only challenging Silicon Valley's conventional wisdom, and increasingly it's reinventing startup best practices in meaningful ways. And Out Innovate tells their stories centered around 10 broad thematic areas where I think the best entrepreneurs are taking Silicon Valley's conventional wisdom, turning on its head, and actually teach us a totally new way to, to innovate and, in many cases, out innovate. Very interesting. In fact, the genesis of this podcast, Maharajas of Scale, was also around the same theme. I would be mentoring startups in 
India and then time and again I would keep going back to Valley Stories and I thought hey there's so much that's different here the consumer base well you know at the heart of it maybe psychologically Maslow's hierarchy of needs and stuff like that we are possibly the same but in terms of the cultural context the demographic context the economic context there are a lot of different things so our whole podcast started because we wanted to do justice to those stories so you know we are on the same page there that's awesome Yeah, I feel very like-minded, like-minded conversation we're going to have. <laughs> You've introduced uh, readers and us to a new breed of entrepreneurs, frontier innovators, as you call them, right? I can tell that you're very fascinated by them because uh, we've all been fed this uh, soup unintentionally, I would say, by, you know, publications and podcasts and lots of evangelists that, you know, the valleys, the birth of, uh, you know, all entrepreneurism, but... You know, that's not the entire truth. Uh, while it's a fantastic epicenter of all things, but there are people across the world that are doing it. So I can tell that you're very fascinated by them. How are they different from their Valley peers? And, and by the way, I don't think there's anything nefarious happening. I think that the reality is that up until recently, we had one epicenter that kept churning out successful startups and we've naturally looked to that. I think what's happening today is innovation has gone global. Right. There are over 1.3 million startups around the world. There's 480 innovation ecosystems around the world. And those numbers are already probably outdated and, and are, are bigger already. Innovation has really moved around the world. And so has the creation of successful businesses. And so now best practice is shifting. In the book, I talk about this notion of frontier invaders. And obviously, The world of innovation is not Silicon Valley or not Silicon Valley. It's much more heterogeneous than that. Using one highly simplistic heuristic, you might say there are startup ecosystems that are operating in more developing or developed uh, countries and in more developing or developed startup ecosystems. You might say Silicon Valley operating in a developed country and a very, very strong startup ecosystem. In the book, I talk about entrepreneurs operating in North Korea, right? You might say opposite end of both spectrums, developing country, very nascent startup ecosystem. And then there's places like Winnipeg, right? In Canada, developed country, but very emerging startup ecosystem. And on the opposite end, you might say Bangalore, right? Powerhouse of innovation in a developing country. And obviously there's a lot of differences in, in, in these places. So in the book, I purposely take us to extremes. I juxtapose what it's like to innovate in places in sub-Saharan Africa relative to the valley uh, to really show the extreme differences. But to pull apart some of the threads, I, I look in some of the places that are a little bit a little bit more similar in some dimensions and different in others. And I think that taken together, when you, when you look at it, you say, look, the book is not a recipe book. It isn't a follow A, B, C, and D, and you'll get C, right? You can't copy paste what happens in Brazil and put it in India. In any case, you still need to be thoughtful and reflective and understand the local context too. So I think this is much more, I think the ideas that I have around being a playbook, around take what works, leave what doesn't, apply it, but be reflective and think about what the right playbook is for you in your ecosystem. And so that's a little bit of how I think the frontier works and how some of these entrepreneurs are themselves similar to each other, but also, you know, obviously have, have a lot of nuances between them as well. Are there some common threads and similarities? How are these, uh, if you were to pick out, let's say the top four or five differences between frontier innovators and their valley peers, what would they be? Yeah, so in the book, I have 10 broad thematic areas that essentially outline that. Um, and so to give you a flavor of some of the things that I think are, are really powerful, one is how to think about the type of business you're building. So I talk about entrepreneurs that are creators rather than disruptors. So creating industries from the get-go rather than taking a philosophical view of taking industries that already exist and are relatively efficient and finding a more efficient solution. So one is kind of the, the pro project, project selection. Two is kind of the approach to growth. In the book, I talk about taking a camel-like approach, building sustainability and resilience into the business model from day one. There isn't room to build with a growth at all costs methodology. It isn't possible to burn at all costs, have unsustainable unit economics um, in a context where capital isn't unlimited and where there are more macroeconomic shocks. Three, often you have to build more enabling infrastructure to make things work. Software alone doesn't make the, the product work. You have to build a bunch, of, a bunch of other things around that. 
before, you know, how you might think about hiring and building your team in a context where there might not be the same depth of trained startup human capital. And this obviously varies tremendously by city and by geography. Places like Bangalore have incredibly rich startup ecosystem and, and, and talent depth. That's very different than other ecosystems. Um, or, you know, how you think about being multi-market from the get-go. In the U.S., people are very U.S. focused. But if you're in a smaller market like Singapore, by nature, you're taking a multi-market approach. And so those are some of the vectors that I think that there's powerful differences uh, between the different models. And, and, and we're, we're seeing an emerging playbook on how to, how to succeed and how to scale uh, to the point of this conversation. Interesting. The Detroit moment that you talk about in the book is a fascinating one. If anyone has visited Detroit, read uh, Lee Iacocca's bio or Alfred Sloan's biography, or even watch the most recent Ford versus Ferrari, they can discern how Detroit rose and fell. Uh, <laughs> it is now a shadow of its uh, glory past. However, one can but feel that what happened to Detroit happened because power and the market was concentrated within a handful of corporations and people. And hence, in some sense, the decline was inevitable. Uh, Silicon Valley, on the other hand, is a thriving ecosystem. It's it's a thriving hub, maybe a little more, a lot more democratic in its uh, nature than what Detroit was. Why do you feel that Silicon uh, Valley might still have its uh, Detroit moment? Yeah, and in in some ways, I think that the comparisons are obviously not, and there's totally different. But I think here are some other facts that I think are really interesting about the evolution of Detroit. Detroit used to be the Silicon Valley of the day, right? The technology of the day 100 years ago, or I don't know, less than that, frankly, was uh, was technology, not software. And if you were, uh, excuse me, it was automobiles, not software. And if you were an entrepreneur and you were gonna build a new business, you were gonna build a car company. And so there's hundreds of entrepreneurs that are building next generation automobile companies in uh, Detroit. The top three in the world were based there. Um, it was really on top of the world. What happened? Innovation started to take root everywhere. And today, the most powerful engineered cars might be in Germany, and the sexiest sports cars might be in Italy, and the most reliable cars might be in Japan. And the world specialized, and different parts of the world figured out how to do different things in the best way possible. And arguably, say today, the capital of electric cars is Silicon Valley or perhaps Shenzhen. That's what happened. The other thing that happened is best practice shifted. And so think of just-in-time manufacturing, what happened uh, in Japan and was created there. That was developed elsewhere. And I think the same thing is happening in the innovation space, where innovation is going global. And today, the best place to innovate for certain things is Silicon Valley. And I, I, I live in the Valley. I'm a big believer in it. And I think it will continue to being uh, a beacon of innovation for years to come. But also, I think the best place to do different things uh, will exist elsewhere. And uh, we're already seeing you know, innovations in e-government, perhaps you'd go to Estonia, cybersecurity, you might go to Tel Aviv. Places like Minneapolis that have really thriving healthcare ecosystems would be natural places for healthcare. Bangalore is developing its own ecosystem that's inspiring models in many other emerging markets. And so I think we're, we're, we're going to see the specialization that comes. And so I'm not predicting the collapse and implosion of Silicon Valley. I am, I am a big believer, however, that other places will rise. And for Silicon Valley to stay relevant, it needs to learn from and adapt based on the lessons of what's succeeding elsewhere as well. So many of the frontier innovators, such as Jeb also, to Oki, to M-Pesa, they built their entire ecosystem around them as the ecosystem or the enablers, as I call them, is usually non-existent in, non-existent in most non-Valley environments. You know, I started talking about this three to four years ago when I was building my own fashion tech startup. In the West, most creative and digital content is created by the brands and the manufacturers. However, here in India, only tiny, only a tiny fraction of them do that and the rest has to be created by us. So similarly, for a startup like Zillow to happen, you needed the market listing service or the MLS, which was already being provided by the likes of RealPage. The only company that perhaps needed to create all of this from scratch is Airbnb since that model itself was so green. But you don't delve into how these innovators fund the strategy of building the whole stack because uh, building the whole stack means you're building entire pieces of the ecosystem. Capital, for the most part, is really scarce in these markets, uh, the venture capital ecosystem. As I have seen, if, if we take Bangalore as an example, it falls into two buckets. 
the ones that imitate the valley peers that are chasing unicorns and then the rest of them uh, and most of them they don't really have a playbook and uh, you know with first hand being an entrepreneur myself working with these investors uh, i can say that if you talk to them about building the whole stack you know they'll balk at you and say what are you ta- what are you talking about but when you were interviewing them what were their capital strategies how did they overcome the capital problem you know and i think you're hitting hitting the nail on the head on a lot of these right because if i was going to take a step back on some of the lessons i learned through all my interviews is really this necessity of having to do a lot more with a lot less and facing adversity and so i i think the point you're talking about really pulls on on my chapter of this notion of having to build the full stack to be able to build your end product you also have to build a set of enabling infrastructure just to make the business possible there's vertical infrastructure there's also sometimes you have to build a, an ecosystem around your single product to actually fulfill a bunch of needs because the market gap is so wide and so yeah i think it's really really tough and i think that one of the advantages that some entrepreneurs at the frontier are taking and the attitude they're taking is but the reality is you need to build the product you need to do all these things but you don't necessarily need to do it all at once right there's certain staging you can do on being thoughtful about what you need to do one step at a time and being very clear with your funding partners of what you're going to do with one set of money. Um I think two is you can enable other new part of the stack for you. And so uh, in the e-commerce land, you know, Jumia for instance, who I interviewed talked about how they actually created enabling software to allow others um to do deliveries because there was no, you know, addressing infrastructure. There was no uh, logistics uh software uh for players. so they actually created that to then uh enable some third party providers. And so that's something else you can think about doing. And you know, a third sometimes and I think what's happening right now is is we're seeing more and more infrastructure getting built over time by staging it, perhaps others will will come in. So I think there are certain things you can do. That being said, the reality is is building startups when you're creating a market and when you're operating with less infrastructure means you have to do more with less. Um and so you have to be very very thoughtful on being pretty lean when you need to be making sure you're you're able to get through the the long build and and complexity of having to build a couple of different different uh projects at once the example you talked about alluding in my book is is Gil Bolso in Brazil which is a personal finance manager they wanted to build an app you know think of a mint.com or something like that in Brazil you know the the analogy in in, in the valley is you know you could plug in something like Yodly or Plaid which is bank and connections you could plug into a credit scoring infrastructure uh because FICO exists and you can credit into a bunch of different fintechs that'll pay you for leads and yet in Brazil when they started none of those existed so they had to build their own interconnections layer they had to build their uh credit assessment play a little bit like all our credit karma and they had to build their own ecosystem to be able to monetize on that that's really tough that took them longer and so i i i I, th- i think i think you're nailing it on the head on you know one of these one of these big challenges of having to do more with less so one is do more with less and build a camel uh, not a unicorn right so you bootstrap you focus on profitability from the get go and i suppose um, because these aren't yet so competitive as the valley and the challenges of building the stack itself are so daunting that you don't have too many people jumping in with both hands and both feet and say hey i want to do this because there isn't an enabling infrastructure which gives them some sort of that lead time that long runway to say okay these pieces don't exist i i have a, i want to fly a plane but i don't even have a tower so let me just build the whole thing and then take off do you think that's exactly what's possibly uh going on here yeah i think that's part of it and i think the other side is like when i talk about the camel it's building sustainability and resilience to the business model from the get go that doesn't mean that you are staying subscale and you don't have an ambition to grow right? right camels are animals that can sprint across the desert drink water faster than any other thing when times are good right. but they can also survive when times are tough and so i think that it is not inconsistent with taking a camel like approach to raise venture capital that you need to be able to get through it but it's rooted in a philosophy and an approach of not massively subsidizing user acquisition not hiring way ahead of burn not taking a short term lens on the world it's keeping this long term approach keeping sustainable unit economics and a business model and and keeping burn under control i think you can still raise venture capital to be able to solve some of these problems um like having to build the full stack right and and those are venture capital 
I think can be a very powerful tool. You know, full disclosure, I am a venture capitalist, but I think it needs to also be used very thoughtfully and for the right moments at the right times in a, in a company's inflection points uh, and in the right amounts. So then these uh, frontier innovators are some really shrewd entrepreneurs then. Because you know that ta- it takes a lot of acumen to understand, hey, this is the money that I have, but I can't be spraying it all over the place in user acquisition because I need to build a stack. So that's that's interesting. The next question I'm about to ask is a little bit controversial, uh, but uh, you know, bear with me on that one. From Gojek in Indonesia to Mercado Libre in Latam uh, to Adamex and Karim in the Middle East, most of these startups are copies of their Western counterparts, right? So as much as I'd love to think that they're innovating, I can't help but feel that they're perhaps adapting these Western models to their context rather than innovating. In some sense, I call it copycat innovation. And let me elaborate, allow me to elaborate a little bit. By the way, I I actually totally disagree with you. I actually think if anything, some of these models are harder to do. But finish your thought, but I, I actually be curious. Yeah. So let me contextualize contextualize my uh, comment uh, for a second. Uh, Let's take India as an example. Unlike the United States, the Indian market has a huge offline retailer network, right? All these are independent mom and pop stores. In in the United States, about 90% of retail is organized. India is just the opposite, right? So uh, we have a couple of startups in here. Uh, While that still exists, uh, when you start going into the hinterland, tier three, tier four towns, the retail network is not as dense. Uh, It's super disorganized. So if you wanted to build something really a good distribution network, let's say Procter & Gamble, Unilever have existed for quite some time, you don't really get any organized players, right? But smartphone penetration was uh, phenomenal. So if you were, uh, one of the things that the internet has done is it's created a lot of the Etsy type entrepreneurs, there are a lot of artisans, there are a lot of independent producers, there are a lot of mini brands, not the mega FMCG brands. So what there are a couple of startups called Misho and Glow Road in India. What they've actually done is they have leveraged the Tupperware equivalent network of women and they've turned each of these women into entrepreneurs. So what that has done is it has created a phenomenal distribution network for brands that cannot afford to build these massive supply chains and then distribution networks, right? I call it contextual innovation. In fact, it's not even replicating a supply chain. All it is doing is taking all of these informal nodes or, you know, endpoints and then building massive networks out of them. Each of these, both of these are uh, now approaching a billion dollars and hundreds of millions in uh, volume. Uh, For me, that's an original, local, relevant innovation. You, you, You can't take this outside of India unless and until the cultural context is identical. You cannot make this work because it's got so many nuances here. So I... For me, that is what I'm trying to get at. Many of the frontier innovators, in some sense, they've spent time overseas. They've understood Western models. And don't get me wrong, they're smart, they're shrewd. uh, But in some sense, it's copycat innovation. Maybe it's it's a starting trend. And I feel in some sense, some of the strategies they've used are drawn out of the valley because, um, and not all of it, because they're trying to build a Western-style startup. Once you start to build a local-style startup, uh, then you have need a different playbook. What do you think? So I think there's a lot of a lot of ways to to respond to that. I think first, I think those startups, I think, are really great examples of local innovation and coming. And I think that's some, one of the things we're seeing. That being said, I I do disagree with the premise that localization and doing a model like Gojek is not innovation. Um, I think if anything, some of those models are harder because of having to do more with less in a lot of these things. But I actually think the broader point that you're nailing is that the source of innovation is now different. In the book, I talk about this idea of the innovation supply chain. I actually think that historically, if you look back 20 years, like the 2001, a lot of what was happening is you would take the Amazon model, eBay model replicated elsewhere. And that's the Mercado Libre example. Although I still think there's a lot of localization involved to do that. But what is happening now today is that the best ideas are not just emerging They are emerging from everywhere and they are influencing startups everywhere. And so the idea of Gojek, by the way, uh, to pick up on that, 
Obviously, ride sharing was started in the U.S. with Uber and Lyft. It was replicated elsewhere. Um, the model was heavily adapted in, in Indonesia, where it's primarily a ride sharing model. When I interviewed Nadim, the CEO and and, and uh, the co-founder, he talked a lot about his vision for ride sharing, which is totally different than what the ride sharing companies were doing in the U.S. His vision was to actually employ the driver to give the driver work throughout the day. In the morning, you might drive someone to work. At lunch, you deliver food. In the afternoon, you drive them home. At night, you deliver dinner. In the middle of the day, you do e-commerce and offer them financial products and services. Talk about providing an, e um, an ecosystem around them. In some ways, inspired by what's happening in China with super apps. And it's no surprise that the model in the US has now been influenced and I believed improved, right? Uber Eats is right now the dominant form of revenue for Uber. Um, as we're going through COVID. And that is as a result of learning what how these models are playing out elsewhere. And the Uber wallet and Uber credit card. I think it's no surprise that we're seeing those kind of things. And so I think the nature of innovation is not linear and as simple as looking at it as there's one, it comes from one place and it goes somewhere else. I think now increasingly innovation is coming elsewhere. And I think what's exciting about what's happening in India, to your point, is that we're seeing fabulous models scaling in India and in other places that are inspiring startups in other countries. Udon is a great example, right, of a business model inspiring startup founders in different geographies. I think we're going to see more of that. And I think that's a result of this frontier where the best entrepreneurs operating in India trying to formalize and digitize these informal supply chains have in many ways more in common with entrepreneurs in Nairobi doing the exact same thing in a similarly informal dominated economy. So I think we're gonna see a lot more of those kind of things that are gonna happen. But that being said, I, I, I still believe that building any type of startup is an incredible feat. And I think that it's fabulous to get inspiration from wherever it comes. But I do think there's still a lot of localization that's required to make, to make an idea uh, to make an idea work in a tougher ecosystem. So I, I, I still want to give those entrepreneurs credit uh, for the for the incredible mountains that they're climbing. Oh, certainly, certainly. I, the operational challenges um, that you have to face in enabling many of those models here, uh, take the Uber equivalent here, Uber and Ola. If you take a set of forces, let's say garment incentives and uh, a whole host of things. For instance, I'll give you an example right now. The local government in Bangalore or Karnataka, which the state, you know, the state where Bangalore is located, is running a grant slash uh, subsidy scheme. So, an average uh, cab that a cabbie uh, who drives for Uber or Ola, which is an Uber equivalent locally, costs a couple of hundred dollars shy of ten grand. Right? What the government is doing is actually subsidizing the purchase by ninety percent. Right? So. Uh, so the cabbie may not be able to afford the entire $10,000. $10, so the government gives him close to $90,000. The other $10,000 he ponies up and then the cab is his. Uh, he doesn't have a EMI or any sort of debt on, top, on, on the cab. Now what he does is he has to belong to a certain economic, economic backward class or you know certain classified class. Now he starts driving for Uber or Ola. Until recently, I would run into you know, drivers and uh, drivers would say, hey, I have to do at least 20 rides per day. Otherwise, I won't be able to fulfill the debt obligation that I have on my car. And one of the things that this has started encouraging is that while genuine drivers who are unable to pay for their cabs will um, obviously you know, benefit greatly by it, it encourages a great degree of uh, laziness because now dri drivers are cherry picking rides you know, they have a free car, you know, which is practically free and because they've already put in the thousand thousand dollars. So getting those drivers on into the ecosystem is a huge mountain to climb. Uh, the economic motivations and the forces uh, in the United States are way different from what what exists here. So I, I you know, I hear you. These are smart people. You have to be a big tough nut to crack things like these. So um, yeah, that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know that story. So uh, thanks for sharing. <laughs> Let me touch on the impact aspect that you, you know, sort of I think uh, alluded to. Finding A players, you know, building the full stack. Those are amazing things. But inherently, because any sort of formality that you're bringing to an informal economy means that you'll create impact, right? Whether you're 
intentionally doing it uh, or not in if you take the uber equivalent let, let's take bangalore as an example the number of cabbies just under uber and ola are 1 million that is bangalore's population is 10 million and out of 10 million that's about a million cabs it's a phenomenal number of cabs so these people all come from the hinterland uh, many of them don't know the language don't know the lingo in the process you know they're getting a little more smarter they're getting used to a different lifestyle so impact is sort of inherent in the model itself so unintentionally or intentionally you'll end up uh, creating an impact have you seen in in the stories and the models that you studied uh, did you see anywhere the impact aspect not getting played out because i uh, i thought maybe every one of them would end up impacting because the ecosystem itself is so informal yeah you know i i think what's interesting is there's different impact is such a broad term right where in the book i focus on this notion of entrepreneurs that are creating industries rather than disrupting them and focusing on things like healthcare financial services education and you might even put uh future work i think that's one set of impact and and actually the data is pretty clear in the us less than 20% of unicorns are in those industries and in many emerging markets i i i don't have the data on india um perhaps you do but in in sub saharan africa for instance it's over 60% so one of the problems that are getting tackled are different right i think two is i think the question of how impact is built in the business model and i think i i i think one of these is is this uh description that you're talking about right which is job creation and and things like that which are powerful forces for good um in the US for instance all net new job creation has been as a result of entrepreneurship so it isn't something that's unique to emerging markets it's, i think you i think it's true universally that entrepreneurship is an incredible power for uh for impact where i see businesses do this most successfully if have impact as part of the business is where it's the interests of their ecosystem and the interests of their impact are tied directly with the impact uh the operational success of the business. Um so think of something like Revigo in India, right? They're doing logistics and supply chain. One of the things that's powerful about their model, their tagline is making logistics human and they really think about the lifestyle of the driver. And so instead of having a driver drive days and days and days on end with with a load in one direction and maybe not getting anything back and being away from their family or whatever, they built a system where the driver would drive maximum 24 hours in one direction and change it with another driver and the days of change would come back and so they could drive better utilization of the drivers but also better lifestyle for the drivers and that's directly tied with stronger retention and things like that that's where i think that the model for impact succeeds best is where the impact of the business is tied to the operations they don't pull in different directions and where i see it struggle is in the opposite is in the opposite i focused very strongly on a lot of you know A, a lot of businesses are scaling and I think that was one where philosophically the founders were doing this in part for for really wanting to have the impact. Let's talk about regulation a bit. This is a pretty controversial topic or not depending on which side we take. When it when it comes to when it comes to the valley many times you know startups are like you know, hey let's break rules and ask for permission later. Let's get so big that we end up you know forcing re- regulation to adapt around the model that we are building. Airbnb Uber are poster child for that uh, kind of an argument right but in some sense you know you can't help but think that all of these are very heavily regulated markets themselves right uh, take healthcare but in some sense it's a necessity for them because if you waited for regulation to catch up you possibly never could build your model in the first place right so uh, you have to you your intention is not to break the rule but your model is such that it ends up breaking breaking the rules per se right but when it comes to the frontier in many cases you know i see startups that f- fall into possibly two buckets if we take india as an example the amazon's competition which is a flip cart which was acquired by walmart i think for 16 or 17 billion dollars uh started pushing for protection you know when uh, post dem- demonetization Uh, the economy was in some sort of a free fall and then everybody was like walking at them saying that you know you guys are supposed to be the innovators now you're actually asking regulation to be 
written the wrong way. You know, I can give you hordes of examples where frontier innovators and and nobody's denying the heavy lifting they've done, you know, what they've built. But in many cases, uh, you know, they've also benefited from the lack of regulation, right? So now all of a sudden, it, it's a very classic playbook to benefit from a status quo and then all of a sudden ask for protection because uh, a set of things are threatening you. And on the other hand, you have a set of startups that are actually saying, hey, we don't have a regulatory environment. So let's, let, I'll give you an example. There's a ride sharing, a true ride sharing startup in India called Quick Ride. Given the number of cabbies, regulation locally today is written on paper in such a way that ride sharing is illegal, right? But these guys are saying, hey, the ride sharing is genuine. People genuinely want a ride share. Now don't make it illegal, right? So there are startups working at both ends of the spectrum in the frontier. What sort of contribution are you seeing frontier innovators to? Are they being the pariahs or are, are they being a p- positive contributors to regulation? Yeah, what I believe is that this approach of move fast and break things and it's okay to ask for forgiveness, etc. I think generally that attitude is different mm-hmm. at the frontier. And I think the reason is because the type of business that you're doing if you're just providing someone a wallet like Venmo that's pocket money and it crashes, it's okay. It's not the end of the world for that person. If the Uber app goes down, it's not the end of the world because you could take a taxi, right? Like the downside is different. But what if you're providing someone um, their core bank account and access to the formal economy? If you're providing someone their healthcare service or what have you, the stakes are much higher. And the consumer segment you're targeting is the mass market. So it's a different consumer segment. And so I actually think generally founders are taking this approach of, you know, let's be much more responsible. Let's move fast and break things. It's okay to break the law uh, type approach. I think generally is different. And particularly for entrepreneurs that I talk about that are creators, where they're building an entirely new industry, I've seen them work constructively. So one example that I talk about in the book is a startup uh, called Zola in uh, in Africa that's building off-grid energy. And they, among a couple other startups in the sector, came together and built an organization uh, called the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association to basically help figure out what the problems were proactively and figure out how to engage with regulators around those questions. Um, so I, th- I think that's something generally my, my philosophy is that that's the right attitude and the right approach, particularly for the sectors that I'm talking about. I also think there's room for regulators to do really catalytical things to support innovation. Um, and so one of the things that you could do, for instance, is in the fintech uh, space, people are experimenting with sandboxes, creating a boxed environment where you say, you can experiment, we'll test and see what happens within this confined amount of users and product specs, etc. And then once we have a data set, rather than regulate you ahead of time saying this new product is legal or not legal, you know, uh, you can even imagine it for ride sharing, right? Let's box it in first, see what happens and what the impact is on consumers and what are the risks and then make a regulatory. So I actually think there's an opportunity for regulators to have this open dialogue with innovators, particularly when the innovators solution doesn't fit nicely within one of the existing boxes, um, which is obviously usually the case when you're trying to create a new market and trying to do it in some of these higher impact sectors. So I, I actually think there's an opportunity on both sides um, of the table to, to have better dialogue. I think I l- love what you just said, the sandbox where you have you know, a set of pro positive business model enablers on the regulatory on the tech side. We've seen some of that. For example, I think Estonia and uh, Switzerland have done with that work for blockchain and crypto-based startups. They've proactively created sandboxes. They've created uh, regulatory sandboxes in some sense, which give you certain powers, but we are yet to see that happen. I think the most striking example is India's uh, payments innovation ecosystem. Mm. The Indian National Payments Corporation of India has put together a bunch of things over the last decade or so. So yeah, um, so I, I think uh, if other ecosystems started emulating it, uh, I think we would see big impact. You haven't touched on uh, the blockchain part. You, you, you've talked about ICOs in the book, how it could become, the model itself could become a force to reckon with in terms of uh, the way, uh, you know, frontier startups uh, raise uh, capital. Obviously, blockchain or cryptocurrencies are not going away. If anything, possibly they're going to take deeper root. Depends on 
when the you know the dollar gets off of its uh, reserve currency status uh, we, we don't know how those currency wars are going to get unleashed but in general what do you think uh, is likely to happen what what do you think blockchain or cryptocurrencies are likely to do to any of these innovation hubs or the innovation that we're seeing so in in the book i i talk about some of the innovations that are happening in the venture capital model mm-hmm. and and i and i like to touch on 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 the blockchain bit because you know the vc model has been around for a long time and itself actually wasn't invented by silicon valley it actually is derivative of the whaling industry of all things i mean it was applied to the vc model and it works extraordinarily well in silicon valley for very particular type of startup we've now scaled it all over the world and you know as as you know in our conversation now i i'm a man of nuance and i and i think the nuance and the differences around the world are are pretty big and 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 i think the vc model needs to get adapted and i think that there are some adaptations that are around the corner that are being tried that people are thinking about and uh there's things around how the product of VC gets evolved there's things around who does the innovation and one of the areas that I think is interesting is like the role of individuals in supporting entrepreneurship and so we've seen the rise of crowdfunding for instance as a way to support early product development ICOs I think of um a little bit in this broader kind of arc of having end users being engaged and in many ways an ICO is a way for people to buy into a particular ecosystem and there is a big mania that happened in 2017 and uh for a quarter more money was raised by blockchain uh by ICO than by venture capital right and you know it's unclear what the I I think I it's unclear what the returns are going to be on like on on those products and and I think is one of those frothy segments in the market where there was just a lot of capital chasing uh too few products and so I actually believe that there's going to be there still is a role for the intermediation of capital there still is a role I'm I'm biased I'm a VC and I think there's a role for VCs to meet a lot of entrepreneurs support entrepreneurs that are promising startup stage capital delivery I think that there's a role for that I also think that there's a role for users to be engaged and for entrepreneurs to create communities around their products. And so I I think there's going to be a role for this. How this plays out is a little bit too early to tell, and I think some of this will depend on our previous conversation on regulation um and and will probably depend country by country. Um so, you know, let's wait and see, but it's definitely one of the things that I touch on in the book that, you know, might manifest itself over time. Sure, I it's one of my favorite chapters. Uh, I have several uh, from the book. You know, I know a lot about venture capital, but I didn't know the thing about whaling and that was I think that chapter was the, the original fintech. <laughs> yeah, it was a fantastic chapter. It's one of my favorite ones, uh, uh, terrific one. In fact, I think you also did in very simple and amazing terms explain how ICOs work. you know if 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 anybody had any questions around how do icos work you know right now i want to just take that excerpt from your chapter and tell people hey just go read alex's um, you know write up you know that will tell you all about how icos work so awesome we can we can put a note on the page in the comments of the in in the show notes we could put a a note to the page <laughs> if people want to re- reference it certainly certainly i'll come back to valley for a moment mark andreessen famously said software will lead the world right so it's that big that quotes become you know all a legend now with covid you know we are recording this episode in the amidst the coronavirus and the covid epidemic work from home uh, when marisa mayer decided she was going to stop all remote work you know it felt like you know major organization had taken a decision that work from home doesn't work but covid has actually forced work from home upon us and in some sense i guess because now it's a necessity a lot of people are discovering that work from home works right so when the offshoring and the global uh, it services era started you had technologies that had to develop c- quickly because work uh, was being delivered remotely so in some sense i'm just thinking the covid era has again put software front and center and in some sense nobody plays a software game better than the valley uh, you know companies so does that put the valley back in the center again for for the foreseeable future you know it's interesting i um i actually kind of see it the the other way um in many ways building distributed teams has been best practice outside the valley for years right there's obviously a very big range of what distributed teams mean like one extreme is everyone is remote and there's no office another uh another end of that spectrum could be you have multiple offices and you have a distributed organization but 
in startup ecosystems where the depth of trained startup people capital is not the same, people tap the world for talent. They tap uh, and build teams around people that they find. If I was uh, building a startup in Winnipeg and I was trying to hire a CMO, um, there aren't 500 of them the way there is in the Valley. There might be five that have worked with startups and are probably engaged with my competitors. And so I'll build my marketing team around whoever I find and they might be in a town a couple hours uh, somewhere else or in another country. And, and so by nature, I think the best entrepreneurs have done this. And so it's no surprise now as the world is shifting to distributed, I think we're looking to best practice on how to do that. And in the US, for instance, um, some of the leaders are companies like Basecamp out of Chicago or Zapier out of Missouri that are fully distributed. And that's where we're gonna learn best practice. And so if anything, I think they're the ones gonna be better positioned because they've already built in a distributed way and they have a cost base that is dif different than, than the Valley. That being said, I think you're right that there's a whole set of tools that will need to get built over time. And those tools will get built. Um, and I think there's some great companies in the Valley as well as elsewhere that are that are doing doing some of those things. But in terms of just generalized innovation, um, I actually think a lot of companies building outside the Valley that are tapping the world for talent, that are operating in lower cost ecosystems that are in these multi-market approaches are well positioned for this. And lastly, make no mistake, I don't believe that remote work will be normal. I think it'll be more normal. But the context that we're living in right now under lockdown, a fear of a pandemic, um, having kids at home and having a school teach them, like that's not normal. And so I, I think we're gonna come back to a place where people are gonna work from home maybe a couple more days a week, but there's still gonna be a role for in-person serendipity in some form. Some companies will choose to be in-person, some companies will choose to be remote, but there isn't gonna be one, we're not gonna flip the switch and it's gonna be 100% remote after this. I think, I, I, I think there's gonna be be some nuance and change. And I think in that nuance and change, companies outside the Valley will be well positioned for, for the reasons I discussed earlier. You, you've touched upon some of those examples in your book, right? So where companies that are distributed globally are trying to create the water cooler conversation you know, with, with various tech tools. That was, uh, that was fascinating to read. One question, uh, you already talked about Uber Eats being an outgrowth of, you know, the contextual innovation that was influencing you know startups back in the valley how extensive is the valley actually getting influenced by innovation that's happening across the world is it happening in a big way is it happening in a small way what i'm trying to say is valley's led the charge but now valley's possibly looking to the world uh, for instance walmart bought uh, flipkart in india which has a wallet called phone pay and, uh, you know, we've heard of many experiments that Walmart is doing to its payments, you know, because of phone pay. Is it a trickle? Is it a flood already? How big is it? I think it is a, uh, a trend with growing momentum. And today, the biggest digital bank in the world is in Brazil. It's not in the US. The biggest payment network, startup payment network, you might say is Paytm in India. The biggest robotic process automation company came out of Romania, UiPath. Some of the biggest startups in the world are coming from markets all over the world. And that's going to continue and that will accelerate and that will also affect the Valley and inspire the Valley and new business models will emerge out of that. So I think we're going to see more and more of that. The Valley continues to be and is an incredible place to innovate and build startups. I just think everywhere else is too. And I think the best entrepreneurs operating ecosystems elsewhere will have a different lived experience. And there'll be understanding different types of problems, like the ones we were talking about before, formalizing the informal economy. That would never come out of the Valley because that's just a totally different type of thing. And so we're gonna see more of that and that will influence startup ecosystems elsewhere. And so I think we're gonna, I think this, this will accelerate. I think this is definitely a full swing and it'll accelerate. And I think we're gonna see more and more of emerging market startups influencing the Valley back as well. One last question, and it's some sort of a pet peeve of mine. I'm- Okay, now I'm nervous. Politics, <laughs> politics, as much as, uh, you know, startups are supposed to be economic engines and they're supposed to be tugging at the economic aspects of our society. But most of the substandard conditions that we find ourselves in when it comes to emerging or developing markets, you know, take India, for example, we have been under the developing label forever now. And uh, you know, 30 years ago, when I was a kid, we would talk about India as a developing nation, and we still talk about India as a developing nation. It is not, it, it's not for the want of capital or our biggest strength is our people, right? So if you look at the United States, it, it was built because of this, because of its people, not because, you know, some big man over there said, you know, let there be light and then there's light, you know, yes, uh, 
but that's not the case but as much as i'd love to appreciate all the innovation that's going on i can't help but feel frustrated in some sense that nobody is actually hacking away at the political systems that are actually entrenched in all these developing nations have you seen any of them when do you think we are likely to see disruption new models being created on the political scene so i agree with you i think the regulatory and political landscape can be both incredible forces of good and difficulty in ecosystems around the world um immigration for instance um is an incredible driver of entrepreneurship around the world and i think some of the actions happening in the us are really shooting silicon valley and the innovation economy in the foot um and i think other countries that are taking a more open stance um like what canada has done with the entrepreneurial visa program and things like that are 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 uh, positive policies to drive to drive that um so i also believe that uh, governments can take really strategic approaches to support innovation and accelerate innovation ecosystem and and you know it's it's important to remember right the us venture capital ecosystem was also as a result of the us government that funded some of the early seed funds that also funded a lot of the early research and things like that and so the government is actually a big driver of even the internet right which is which is which is out of government funded um the same is true of the israeli ecosystem and i think that we're seeing this play out in different ecosystems where you know in estonia where we talked about this before estonia has actually been a very big leader in e-government largely driven by political decisions in india i actually think an incredible experiment is taking place which is autonomy right giving universal identity to a uh, to a country with you know previously not everyone had id id cards um i think is an incredible tool and then tying that with india stack i think there's going to be a range of new innovation that will get built on top of that that will hopefully inspire other countries to uh make make similar models and so you know the work that nanda nilkani has been doing around that i think he's taken a very entrepreneurial approach to driving that and so i that's one area that i'm very enthusiastic about what's happening um in india and 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 in a way you know uh, in, in a way that i think the government's been really Uh, I, I think driving a really powerful experiment that I'm that I'm I'm excited to see play out. So I, I agree with you. I, I think I think it can be a tool for shooting yourself in the foot, and it can also be an incredible accelerant if done thoughtfully and properly with a long-term vision, not one of one political cycle, but really uh, decades uh, ahead of time. So I, I think that's a thoughtful question. Yeah, yeah. Adhar, I think has hit a pause. A set of forces. that benefited from the older uh, status quo used all sorts of uh, subterfuge tactics to defeat it right now it is a half powerful concept than what existed 3 4 years ago uh, but i'm certain that the the framework that exists right now is going to be powerful somebody is going to wake up and say this is fantastic this is good for governance let's uh, resurrect resurrect it all over again so alex it's been fascinating chatting with you you I believe you've lit a fire that has brought frontier innovation to light. I'm certain that this is going to be front and center as the world evolves. I don't think the day is far off when we are going to see this as a moment and say I think uh, what Tom Friedman did to, you know, you know the world being flatter, <laughs> I think you did that to global innovation. Out Innovate is a fabulous read from Delhi to Detroit and uh, you know Sao Paulo. how are these startups changing the ecosystem it's uh, it's amazing the strategies that you've talked about from fundraise to building camels to building a teams and distributed systems are amazing the amount of work that's gone into the book is astounding i we should uh, keep this conversation uh, going revisit it you know as new models continue to emerge any closing comments from you First of all, thank you so much for that and thank you so much for hosting me. I'm uh, I'm excited to listen to many of your future guests and learn from their own experience in uh in scaling in India and employing some of these strat- strategies and developing others as well that I'm excited to learn from. So, thank you so much for hosting me. For those interested, the books available anywhere where books are sold, uh, including Amazon, but in the spirit of COVID and small business support, I'd encourage you to to buy it from your local library near you and you can also follow me at alexlazaro.com. Uh, so thank you so much for hosting me. This is super fun and excited to continue the conversation together. Thank you, Alex. We hope you enjoyed the story. If this story made a difference to you, tell us by leaving a comment on the website or our social media channels. Help us spread the love by subscribing, liking, and sharing our show. We welcome speaker suggestions and collaborations. Write to me at nida at maharajasofscale dot com. Mm-hmm.